Our scripture reading for today is Romans chapter 5. They can be found on our Pew Bibles on page 942. Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death reigned through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the re- not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one, tres- one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. If because of one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the ab- abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ." Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that, as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. With our look at the book of Romans, we are Romans chapter 5. We're going to look today at verses 6 through 8, Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. So if you'd turn or return to that, I'd appreciate it. We're going to look at Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. So I caught a glimpse of something on the television the other day, something that was related to the news, and the president was walking, and as you probably notice this so much that you don't even think about it, as he was walking, he had other people around him. Now, he's not quite like when you see a rapper and he's walking with people around him, that's what we call the posse. Well, typically when the president or somebody along those lines is walking, those folks that are around him are often there to protect him. You're probably familiar with the Secret Service, right? The Secret Service are these folks that are highly trained to protect the life of an individual, in this case, the president of the United States. So much so that they would be willing to take a bullet for the person whom they are guarding. And I thought about that. 
how many people would I take a bullet for? Now, maybe in the foot or the leg, I don't know. I mean, not, not a vital organ necessarily, but it's probably a relatively short list, and it would be somebody that I have a greater connection with, perhaps, for me anyway, than you've paid me money uh, to be there with you to guard you. And I don't know, that may be different for you. You may be willing to take a bullet for a whole host of people out there. But it got me to you thinking about, as I was going through this passage, uh, the value that we put on human life. And on the one hand, human beings are created in the image of God, and they bear a certain dignity just because of this, regardless of anything else. Yet we live in an age where I think there's often a, a pumped up and elevated sense of the dignity of humanity beyond the reality that is spiritual with regard to how we measure up or how we stack up in God's eyes. We often measure people based on ourselves. I look at somebody else and I measure that person based on me. Somebody that's holier than I am, thumbs up. Somebody that I perceive to be less holy is, of course, less holy. It's kind of like when you're out on the road, right? Anybody that's faster than you on the road, maniac. Anybody slower than you, moron, right? I'm kind of the litmus test. I'm the gauge for everything else. But we actually have real standards in a lot of areas of life, but in the spiritual realm especially. And Paul is going to give us some insights into ourselves. And I want you to know he's talking to and about Christians in this particular section of text. Now, if you're just jumping into the book of Romans with us, it's helpful, it's helpful to understand a little bit of how we got here. The book of Romans starts with the Apostle Paul talking about the theme of the book, which has to do with the righteousness of God. In chapter 1, 16 and 17, he is not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is being revealed. Then he immediately goes from talking about the righteousness of God in 1, 17 to chapter 1, verse 18, all the way into chapter 3, 20, talking about the unrighteousness of humanity. There's a stark contrast betwixt the two. And he gets to the end and he culminates with the reality that God is vastly different than any of these human beings. He is unique. He is transcendent. He is so far different than all of these other people. What can be done? God is righteous. He requires righteousness. This is a big problem. We might not have thought so, but Paul makes sure we understand this is a big problem. What's the solution to this problem? He gives the solution starting in chapter 3, verse 21. The solution is a righteousness that is given, a righteousness that is the righteousness of God that is given as a gift to those who believe. Now, what we're doing now, we're in the section where he's talking about the implications. What are the implications for one who is rightly related to God, who by faith is righteous in God's eyes? What are the implications for that human? What does that person have, if you will, as his new status by being a person who's right with God, righteous in Christ? And so this is where we find ourselves. And it's interesting that He's been going up that trajectory and talking about how great we have things now and how great it is for us. And it's almost like he pulls the emergency brake right here, chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. We're going to break this message down into two sections. First thing we're going to look at is how does he describe redeemed people? How does he describe the redeemed? He's going to give you three ways. Three ways he's going to describe us in verses 6 through 8. We'll look at that first, the three different ways he describes us. And then we're going to make sure we understand the point. What's the point he's trying to get across? And we'll develop that a wee bit. So first we're going to look at these three ways he describes humanity. And then secondly, we're going to look at the point of all of this, what he's trying to accomplish here. This is why it's helpful to have the context and see what we've seen before, including in Romans 5 and what comes afterwards as well. So if you would, come with me back to the text. Three descriptions. And in these, it's helpful to understand the sequence of events, the sequence of events. Because what he's going to show is it's not that we became good boys and girls, and now we are somebody important, some sort of big shot, somebody worthy to take a bullet, so to speak. But he's going to see the sequence of events. Before that ever happened, something happened for us. So back to the text, chapter 5, verse 6. The first one we see here, verse 6, while we were still weak, while we were still weak. This is the first description of humanity. Description being weak. He says, while we we're still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the secondly ungodly. Go down to verse 8, but God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners. We're going to look at each one of those. What does it mean to be weak? What does it mean to be ungodly? What does it mean to be sinners? 
look at that, and then we'll come back to the idea of, well, what's the point? Why is he sharing this with us? What does it mean to be weak? What does it mean to be weak? He says, while we were weak. It's an interesting word here that you have for weak in the Greek. If you like to study the Greek, you'll appreciate this perhaps. The Greek word asthenes is translated here by the ESV as weak. Uh, NASB is helpless, the King James without strength. It's interesting that all of these translations also will often translate this word as sick, as in Jesus healed the sick, or they brought the sick sick to him, the idea of infirmed or weak in status of health. There's a sickness that is there, but there's a weakness, and I thought to myself, well, I, I get that now that I've gotten a little older, went to the gym last night, and not as strong as I once was. Is that what he's talking about, that we were weak? Because, I mean, I never really had a prime, but when I was closer to what one might consider a prime, I was stronger. Is this what he's talking about, physical strength, that God can bench press more than we can? Well, in the realm of the kind of descriptions he's using here, I think it becomes more obvious to us. There's a spiritual weakness that also coincides with the frailty of humanity. Now, I'll come back to this idea of weakness, but we looked at this actually last time. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, you're familiar with the situation perhaps where the Apostle Paul prayed to the Lord in 2 Corinthians 12. He had this thorn in the flesh, this messenger from Satan sent to torment him, and he prayed three times that the Lord would remove it. And the Lord says, no, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That's the noun form of what we have as the adjective here, same word. My power is made perfect in weakness weakness. Our weakness, his power. Paul connects these there as well. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, again the adjective for what we have here, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, what he's talking about there in 2 Corinthians 12 is the reality of living out the Christian life. We live the Christian life with an awareness that we are weak to do those things that we know we're supposed to do. But we also have the power of God with us in sanctification. We have the Spirit of God that indwells us. And so in sanctification, we have great confidence that He will do what only He can do. Because the reality is we are weak, so weak that we cannot do what's required of us apart from divine grace. And the grace here, again, is not license or leniency. When He says, my grace is sufficient for you, it doesn't mean my grace means do whatever you want to do. My leniency is sufficient for you. But grace is his transforming, unmerited power that works in the Apostle Paul. So Paul realizes then, well, when I'm weak, I glorify his strength. If anything happens, I will all the more boast in my weakness. Again, same word that's related to here, what we have here for the adjective, ostenes, same concept. But what Paul's dealing with in Romans 5 is not the sanctification aspect, whereby we grow in grace and become more like Christ. He's dealing with the front end. At the front end, in justification, being made right with God, and this is what the chapter first talks about there, right? Verse 1, we have been justified by faith. We were weak, powerless. Now, there's a lot of things we were without strength to do. We were powerless to do that which Christ did which was live a holy and perfect and sinless life. We were not able to do so, which is why we don't have righteousness. Or if we think we have righteousness, our righteousness is as filthy rags, Isaiah 64, 6. But what is it that we have from him? Well, in the spiritual realm, we recognize humanity has certain weaknesses that are easily forgotten. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 talks about the inability the natural person has to even understand the things of God. We sometimes forget this. We're sharing the good news with somebody. We're telling somebody about Jesus Christ, and they just look at us with a blank stare as though we're speaking another language. We're like, what is wrong with this person? Is it me? Am I not using words? Do you not understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? What's the problem here? Well, they might understand the words, but they lack the spiritual ability. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. So if you encounter somebody and you share with somebody, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and how that person might be made right with God, and it seems like foolishness to that person, don't be surprised, because without the Spirit of God, that's exactly what will indeed happen. He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. In John chapter 3, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus in 3, 3, and 3, 5. It makes it clear, you must be born again before you can enter the kingdom. In fact, he says, you must be born again before you can see the kingdom like the kingdom, choose the kingdom, and enter the kingdom. We sometimes think, well, you do all of that stuff. You come to Jesus, you believe in him, and all that, and then you become born again. 
we have a spiritual inability. There's a spiritual deadness. Ephesians 2 talks about the fact that we were dead in sin and trespasses. But God makes us alive in Christ because of his great love with which he loved us. Makes us alive because we're weak. We're without strength. We're impotent as opposed to he who is, of course, omnipotent. We also recognize from Jesus in John 6, 44, it says, no one, Jesus says, no one can or has the ability to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not because you were smarter than the average bear. It's because God in his grace and his mercy did for you that which you were weak to do for yourself, which is bring you to Christ. The first way he describes the redeemed here is those who are weak, helpless, again, the NASB, or without strength in the King James, weak needy in that regard. We come down to the second one. Go with that same verse, verse 6, chapter 5, verse 6. While we are still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Died for the ungodly. Now, Bob Helmick likes to teach us to say, where have I heard that before? Where have I heard that expression, the ungodly? Right back to verse 6. Christ died for the ungodly. Well, if you go back to chapter 4, you see the same expression. Chapter 4, verse 5. Chapter 4, verse 5. In chapter 4, he's using Abraham as an example to show that this is not something new, whereby God justifies people by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. Nobody ever earned salvation with God. And how does he do this? He goes back to Abraham, even prior to Moses, and shows Abraham as the perfect example, because Abraham, Genesis 15, 6, believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Chapter 4, verse 5. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. That phrase I want you to see there is justifies the ungodly. Now, you may have picked up on that when we went through that. It was an interesting expression. He doesn't wait for somebody to become godly. Again, remember the sequence of events. It's not that we become godly, we become good boys and girls, and he says, I'll pick that one, and I'll pick that one, and I'll pick that one. He justifies the ungodly. He justifies the weak, the ungodly. It's not the only time you've heard that, if you've been with us in Romans. Go back to Romans 1, verse 18. Romans 1, verse 18. Now, this is the interesting connection, because his reader, especially those of a Jewish background, would bristle at that term being called ungodly. We're not like the goyim. We're children of Abraham. What are you talking about? We've got the law. We've got circumcision. We've got all these things. And remember back in chapter 1, verse 18, when he started to show the unrighteousness of humanity, he deals first with the rank-and-file heathen. And you look at the people out there, and it's easy for us to do, too. Look out there and say, oh, oy vey, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like those people out there. And then kind of talk about our spiritual pedigree. But how does he talk about them in verse 18, chapter 1? For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For because God has shown it to them, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse." What he did there, you may recall, is he goes to the culpability of humanity. Look at how they live. There's a God up above. They know this because he's communicated certain things about himself, his eternal qualities. We know the heavens declare the glory of God, Psalm 19, 1. But how do they respond? Do they worship him like they should? No. No, they do not. They exchange the truth of God for a lie, and they worship created things rather than the creator. And they suppress the truth of God with their ungodliness and their unrighteousness ungodly people. Oh, yes, they're bad. Remember, then he goes into chapter 2, saying, well, what about the moral person that thinks he or she is pretty good? Nope. Also under the wrath of God. Then he gets to the Jew. Well, what about the Jewish person with the law and all of that? Also under the wrath of God. Why? Because, yeah, they have the, the law. They don't keep it. It's not those who have the law that do anything impressive. It's those who keep the law. And here, he's tying the redeemed people back in God justifying the ungodly in 4 or 5, and here in one eighteen, this ungodliness and saying, you're not so different, you who are Christians. This is how we all were. Now, we may not have been to the same degree, but we also suppressed the truth of God, and we did what we wanted to do. That's the essence, really, on some level, of our rebellion. 
And so we tie this in. When he says that we are the ungodly, well, the only hope that we have is four or five that God justifies the ungodly by faith and a recognition that we are in that same camp as these ungodly ones that if he was reading this, they would have been very easy to go through. And if you read that passage, chapter 1, 18 through 32, it's really easy to look around out there and say, <laughs> I'm seeing this right before my eyes. But it's also real easy to forget that's the category in which we fall as well as the ungodly. It may not be the same in its degree, but the same as far as category. We were the ungodly, as he says there in chapter 5, verse 6. Christ died for the ungodly. Keep that in mind, because if you think, well, not me, I was the godly. Well, Christ didn't die for you. He died for the ungodly. So there's no hope for you if you consider yourself godly. Number three, verse eight. But God shows his love for, the, for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The third way he describes humanity is as sinners, as sinners. Now, on some level, that might seem like not that big a deal, and it might seem just etymologically etymologically obvious one who runs is a runner one who swims is a swimmer one who sins is a sinner none of us no none of us in here are without sin we're all categorically sinners so yeah okay that's fine but we forget what he told us back in chapter 3 verse 23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of god and that's a problem for the Apostle Paul. Why? Because our unrighteousness is in great contrast to the righteousness of God. There's the rub. We have sin, and it is sin that is great because our God who is holy is great. And so there's a great disparity between us. Well, what would you expect for sinners? Would you expect God to say, ah, does he have kind of an ah shucks attitude for sin? Well, if you know Romans 6, 23, you know the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what our wages, if we wanted to earn something before him, all we have to offer is our sin. And what does that get us? It doesn't get us a pension plan anywhere you want to live, if you know what I mean. It gets us physical death, spiritual death, eternal death, and hellfire forever and ever and ever. This is what you would expect for those who are sinners. But that's not what we get, which is somewhat surprising. Instead, we get a God who meets that great need. Some of you have heard me share this before. We have a great sin, but we also have a greater Savior that can handle our sin. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. And I'll pause there for a moment, because a lot of people look in the world and they say, you know, if, if people just had more money, the world would be a better place. If people were just more educated, the world would be a better place. We have access to education. We're more college educated in this country than we've ever been. Has our morality gone up? Not so much. We have more money. Has our morality gone up? Clearly, we have all the entertainment you can handle, typically in your phone all the live long day. Are we more happy? Clearly, we're not that as well. But our greatest need was for forgiveness. So he sent us a Savior. We needed forgiveness for our sin. Sin is an offense against God and must be reconciled. Now, in the Old Testament, Ezekiel 16, which if you'd like to look this up on your own time, I would hardly recommend, Ezekiel 16 is a great detailed exposition of God's relationship with the people of Israel. Because sometimes Israel would start to think, we're pretty good. We're certainly better than all those other nations. And God goes to great lengths to make it clear, look, I did not choose you because you were great. In fact, far from it. You were not great by any stretch of the imagination. It gets very graphic. Forewarned, you may not even want to read it with your children, how graphic the description is with regard to how God condescendingly takes this Israel for his bride. So you have here, similarly, an interesting description from the Apostle Paul. He describes us as weak, ungodly sinners. Well, why? Why? doesn't seem very nice. We don't come to church to get beaten up, Paul. We come to get church to hear about our best life now and how exciting and happy things are going to be. And I, I'd like to get an uplifting story before I go, Paul. What's the point of doing this? Now, on some level, it's strange because these are not new things that he shared with us. We've talked about a little bit of this already. He's already talked to us in the book of Romans about this universal culpability. If his point is to try to show that everybody's under the wrath of God, we've seen that before, right? Go back to chapter 3, verse 9. Chapter 3, 9 through 20, he makes it very clear here that everybody is under the wrath of God and needs righteousness. Chapter 3, verse 9, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. 
For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace, they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Very explicit demonstration of unrighteousness, depravity. Verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So we already knew, Paul's not giving us something new here, is he? I mean, we already knew this. We already knew that everybody, everybody's weak, ungodly, sinners. What's he doing here? He's talking to us a little bit here about the death of Christ. Is this new to us to know that Christ and his death is the antidote or the solution to this? Back to the text, chapter 3, verse 21, 21 through 26, give us insight into the solution. But now... The righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. Verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus, through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. The sin was not only forgotten about, but it was actually paid for on the cross. When Jesus Christ goes to the cross, he does so as a propitiation to satisfy the wrath of God, who punishes that sin, and he punishes the Lord Jesus Christ. He treats him on the cross as a sinner, so that he could treat those who are sinners as righteous. We're not righteous, but we have the righteousness of God as a gift. He's not a sinner, but he bears our sins on the cross as our propitiation. Propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So we've already seen this from Paul before and in fact in greater detail. So what's new here? I'm going to walk you through it. Let's go back to chapter 1 verse 7. Chapter 1 verse 7. There is a new element here that we haven't seen before. Chapter 1 verse 7. The Apostle Paul is writing this letter to to all those in Rome who are, emphasis mine, loved by God and called to be saints. Loved by God. Now, would you be surprised to know that he talks here about being loved by God and he never talks about the love of God again until you get to chapter 5. Did you know this? doesn't mention the love of God again until you get to chapter 5, verse 5. And there he kind of mentions it, and it's kind of an interesting way because he's talking there about the love that we have with God in the present tense. God is presently loving us. So we're loved by God, and the present tense, chapter 5, go back to verse 5. Chapter 5, verse 5. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts. God has poured his love into our hearts. And we connected that with sanctification. That's how we grow in grace. And interestingly enough, then you get it again in verse 8. But God, verse 8, shows his love for us. And that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the new wrinkle that he's developing here. And the point is not to beat us up, to make us feel bad, to lower us a few pegs in our own eyes, but to show the dramatic, condescending, gracious nature of the love of God seen at the cross seen at the cross. Now, in the Old Testament, God would repeatedly go back to the people and say, look, I'm the Lord your God who took you up out of the land of Egypt, and he reminded them of the Exodus, where they had been sent a deliverer in Moses, and he led the captives free from bondage in Egypt. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the implication is always, why didn't you trust me? Why didn't you follow me? Why didn't you obey me? We don't look back to that. What do we look back to? We look back to the cross. We look back to the cross as evidence, the fact that we were weak and ungodly sinners, Christ died for us. We looked back to the cross as evidence of God's love for us. 
Now, that's important to think through because we can easily forget and we can easily start to live a life where we think, well, God loves me more today than he did yesterday because I'm better today than I was yesterday, as though God is a responder to how lovable we are. When the reality Paul is making is you weren't lovable, but God loved you. How do you know? You look to the cross. The cross reminds us of this. Christ's sacrifice for his people on the cross is not a demonstration of our worthiness. It's not that Jesus said, those people are really good. I'm going to write their names down, and I'm going to go die for them because they are really good. As though you might say, he's willing to be our secret service agent. No, no, the actual opposite is he's not ignorant of who we are. He's not ignorant that we are weak ungodly sinners when he goes to the cross. He doesn't go with any confidence in our potentiality because any change is going to be brought by him by the power of the Holy Spirit. So Christ's sacrifice for his people on the cross is not a demonstration of our worthiness, but a demonstration of God's condescending, gracious love. Now, why do I say it's not an evidence or a demonstration of our worthiness? Go back to verse 7, chapter 5, verse 7. Chapter 5, verse 7. For one would scarcely die for a righteous person. And I say, look, let's talk about human nature. You got a righteous person, you might be willing to die for a righteous person. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one might dare even die. But God demonstrates his love, shows his love for us. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The great contrast is it might seem reasonable that somebody would die for a special person, a really good, righteous, important person. But it doesn't make a lot of sense that you would have weak, ungodly sinners and somebody would die for that individual. Unless you have a God, a God who has a love that is beyond our understanding and comprehension. Because we don't typically love that way. We typically love those who are lovable or do something for us. I've often counseled people in premarital counseling, and I say, no, you need to understand that at this point, your love is really based on, I love you because you do something for me, you make me feel a certain way, or whatever the case is. Hopefully that love matures beyond that, because if it doesn't, it won't last very long, because it doesn't take much before somebody does something that will disappoint you along the way. But you have with Christ, his sacrifice on the cross, it's not a demonstration of our worthiness, but it's a demonstration of God's condescending, gracious love that he has for his people. If you go into it on to verse 10, we're described as enemies. Verse 10, we're described as enemies. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. Well, what would you normally expect to happen to enemies? Matthew 25 gives you some insight into this. Matthew 25, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, he separates the sheep and the goats. And where do the goats go? Into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That's what you would expect for the enemies of God. But though we were enemies of God, we don't receive that. Instead, we receive the cross. We receive propitiation. We receive this as an evidence of, his God, of God's love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This demonstrates his love for us. You wouldn't expect that, but that's indeed what happens. When Jesus Christ goes to the cross, it's not against his will. He says in John 10, I lay down my life for the sheep only to take it up again. He goes willingly to the cross, although there's culpability for those who took him there. And in this, he, going to the cross, cancels our debt, pays for our sins, cancels our sin. Colossians 2, 13 and 14 says this, Having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Now, that's great imagery. I'll read that again. Because think, if you will, what they would often do is they would put on the sign, they would put what your crime was. Now, the Romans did this not because they were just mean But they wanted to communicate, don't let this happen to you. See this guy, a bit of a rabble rouser or a thief, strip him naked, put him on the cross, leave him up there to die. That's a deterrent from other people doing this. They don't do like we do, or you take somebody off in a quiet room and you give them lethal injection or something like this. They are doing this to be a deterrent. They try to rule with a bit of a fist of iron. This is how you keep the Pax Romana, right? The peace of Rome through power and strength. So this is a deterrent. And so they would put on there what the crime was so the Jew did not want to do this. You may recall they put with Jesus, king of the Jews. And the Jews were like, no, 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 can we just put, he claimed to be the king of the Jews. Hey, what what I put, I put. Deal with it. This was his crime, being seen as a king. Colossians 2, 13 and 14 again. Having forgiven us all our trespasses, how? By canceling the record, canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. 
The law demanded because of your sin that you die. The sin that sinneth shall die. Sin must be paid for. Christ pays for it. Having forgiven us, again, Colossians 2, 13, 14, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. The Lord Jesus Christ goes to the cross with a plan in mind and executes that plan perfectly. Paul Tripp says this, when Jesus went to the cross, he didn't purchase the possibility of salvation, as if his death opened the door for people to walk through later in life, if so they choose. No, Jesus took names to the cross. There's intentionality of love when he goes to the cross for his people, when he dies for the weak, ungodly sinners like us. I've often talked in a sermon about how one is made right with God through Christ because of what happens on the cross and what can be yours. And you've probably heard me mention who Christ is and what he's done, that he is the second member of the Trinity who came down from heaven, fully God and fully man, Started as a baby in the manger, but grew up and lived a holy and perfect and sinless life. Died on the cross to pay for sin. Not his sin, of course, because he had none, but the sin of others. So that if we would turn from ourselves and our sin and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, in his death, burial, resurrection, we would receive his righteousness and he would receive our sin. Second Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin, I think most of us know who that is, become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ on the cross is not a sinner, but God treats him as a sinner. We are not righteous in and of ourselves, but God treats us as righteous and credits us with righteousness because of faith. But I thought even more about that. When I say turn from ourselves, I think Paul would say turn from your weak, ungodly, sinner self and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You you sense more the futility of life without Christ. And how he and he alone is the means whereby we can be made right with God. I encourage you to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to trust in him and him alone for the forgiveness of your sins. Because it's the only way a person who is weak, ungodly, and a sinner can ever be made right with God. And in doing so, you experience the reality of the love of God as is demonstrated there on the cross. I'll leave you with this. Uh, In the Old Testament, again, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And that foreshadowed for us the great deliverance that we have. So that if God ever says, I love you, you might think, how have you loved me? I had a flat tire the other day. We had a car battery we had to replace. Do you really love me? Why is bad stuff happening? All you have to do is look to the cross. Look to the cross as a demonstration. In fact, go back to the text Back to the text in chapter 5, verse 8. But God shows his love for us. It's interesting, the tense of that verb, and I don't want to get too word nerd on you here, but it doesn't say God showed, past tense, his love, or demonstrated, some translations would say, but it says shows or demonstrates. The cross still, to this day, demonstrates God's love for you. Each and every day, challenges, difficulties along the way. We've talked about even sufferings and how they come into play. God's love for us, in case we were wondering, in case we were dealing with challenges and difficulties in this process of character being developed and such, we look to the cross as a reminder of God's love for us. Your failures, though there may be some, do not separate you from the love of God. How do you know? You know the cross. Like I said before, most of us think in terms of love as what's in it for me. I like to call that the law of WIFM. You've probably heard me say that before, WIFM, W-I-I-F-M. What's in it for me? Guy comes to a young lady, proposes marriage, and she's thinking, she may not ask it out loud, what's in it for me? Can I do better, right? And when couples get married, now there's certain things that attract them to one another. Might be, I don't know, might be looks, might be wealth, might be even health. Because you hear them say, for richer or for poorer, right? Those kind of things. But, well, what happen if, happens if we lose our looks? Or what happens if we lose our wealth or lose our health? If I become paralyzed, is my spouse going to leave me? Is she going to upgrade at that position? We don't always have that same kind of confidence in humans because their love is often very much based on particulars and conditions being met. But God's choice of you It's not conditioned upon anything good that you've done. He chose you whilst you were still a weak, ungodly sinner. And as such, 
you can have confidence knowing that if you do something that demonstrates your weakness, your ungodliness, and your sinfulness, God is not only not surprised and not shocked, but because he didn't fall in love with you because you were so awesome, but rather decided to love you in spite of that, you can have confidence that his love will transcend your inability to do that which we, are, of course, know we are supposed to do. And any time you question the love of God, look to the cross, look to the cross, and you will see there not our worthiness, but you'll see a demonstration of God's gracious love. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have been blessed in so many ways in our relationship with you. It's easy to forget how we became one of yours and how we were adopted into the family of God in spite of ourselves. And yet, I pray that you would help us to have better memories, help us to recognize the greatness of the salvation that we have and the amazing love that loves the unlovable a condescending, gracious love in spite of ourselves as being weak and ungodly sinners. You sent your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who laid down his life for the sheep only to take it up again. We thank you and praise you for the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, that by faith in him we can be right with you and have the righteousness of God. So that's in his name we praise you and thank you. Amen.